That's what I want to turn you to. Of course, Turkey has been a candidate. The Turkey wanted it to be used in 1963. Wanted it in a long time. And it's officially a candidate. Of course, Turkey is large. I think there are, what, 80 million Turks? Maybe, maybe more. Maybe 85 million, maybe even 100 million. 75 million? A lot of Turks. Most Turks are very poor. We're talking Mexico country dishes here, right? Turkey's another country that I visited a lot. And those Turks are very poor. Now, there are a lot of very rich Turks. It is like Mexico in that respect, too. The rich are really rich. Like, you know, all that way, only in third world countries can the rich be rich. Okay, there are teams of servants running around at any given time. Now, Turkey is, is, has officially become a, a candidate for membership in the EU. And that candidacy was used beautifully by, by the EU in ensuring that the military, because Turkey had a big problem with the military taking over every once in a while, keeping the military out of politics, improving Turkey's human rights record, ensuring that Turkey had a market economy that was compatible with the rest of Europe, and Turkey's economy had been growing like gangbusters. But they haven't left the country. And it looks like it's going to be a while. Why? One, Turkey is very poor. Number two, Turkey has started consistently electing a government which is explicitly Islamist in orientation. The AK party. Okay, okay. The AKP is explicitly Islamist in orientation. Turkey itself, until recently, was strictly secular. Very strictly secular. Way more secular than Canada. For example, women could not wear headscarves at universities. Right? And I think in many universities, they still cannot. There was a very strict separation of church and state. This was part of the initial design of Ataturk, the first Turkish leader after World War I. And part of Turkey's democratization has been the reintroduction of Islam into public life. And they haven't really fully figured it out yet. Because the current government is pretty Islamist. They say they're not going to become like Iran. And I, I tend to believe them. On the other hand, they're pushing and pushing at, at the limits. Some people say, no, 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 they're Islamist in the way that the Christian Democrats in Germany are Christian. That is, it's a reference to heritage. But there's, a, there's some contrary evidence here. It's very controversial, and I don't want to get into it too much. But from the standpoint of the EU, it's kind of freaked out the Europeans. Now, the Europeans never, ever say, they never say we're not going to let Turkey in because of the Muslims. That's never the official line. There are a lot of Muslims within Europe itself, right? And you can imagine those Muslims in Europe wouldn't be feeling very good about themselves if they're saying, yeah, every other country can get it, but this one not because they're, they're, they're Muslim. But there is this discourse going on in Europe now, and that's combined with the fact that Europe is also enlarged for a lot of other countries. Remember, in, in 1999, they agreed to let in, and they eventually subsequently did let in, um, Hungary, uh, Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, now they let in Bulgaria, Romania, these countries which are also very poor, Cyprus, not as poor as Turkey, but still pretty poor. And so to say we're not letting in Turkey because it's poor doesn't really jive. So they're kind of stuck. So they're in negotiations with Turkey, but those negotiations are schlepping out. They're dragging out, of course, a Yiddish technical term, meaning dragging out. They're dragging out. And when the Turks are actually going to be allowed in, I don't know. The Europeans are kind of have, are fatigued by this, and of course, September 11th happened in the meantime with all of this, which of course freaked everybody out with this one. And, you know, I'm not saying there's not a lot of prejudice. There's a dynamic amount of prejudice at work. Of course there is. Uh, if Turkey were 3 million people rather than 75 million people, everybody would say, oh, well, hell. 
who cares? But it's 75 million people with open borders and an open market and all that kind of stuff. Now other people are saying, no, 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 you've got to let Turkey in. This is the one chance that Europe can actually act in a geopolitically responsible way. Take a big, huge Muslim country and say, you're part of the winners. What a cool thing to be able to do. And the French are saying, I, I, I don't know. And that's what's going on here today. It's, it's, uh, they're in an in-between situation. Will Turkey eventually get it? I predict yes. I predict yes. When? You guys may be standing on this stage teaching classes, but I'm not asking. That's what I'm saying 10 or 15 years. <laughs> so that's just the way it is. Um, OK, let me push on. Even in today, Europe, there is no European criminal law. Criminal law is still a national level law. And the last time in 2005, they actually tried to have a European constitution, the French and the Netherlands rejected it. And that doesn't mean they rejected the existing treaties. In fact, the constitution itself was simply taking big covers and putting them around the existing treaties. And said, hey, think about what is a constitution? What is a constitution? It's an interesting question for political science 101. You should probably know. We haven't talked about it yet. It's shocking. A constitution does two things. It lays out the rules of the game. Right? When you get the vote, what the institutions look like, yada, yada, yada. It lays out the rules of the game for politics. Those are already in place in the treaty. It actually didn't need a constitution. What is the other thing constitution does? Yeah. Yeah, it sets out the jurisprudence, but that's also rules of the game. That's a, it's in the same category. What are the rules under which the treaties can be changed? What are the rules of the rules? All that kind of stuff. Like in Canada. What else does the treaty do, though? What else is the Constitution? Sorry. The what? It keeps the politicians in line, but that's through the rules of the game. That's the rules of the game. Yeah. Unlike each other, more and more. 
one thing to have the British and French, everybody, all the French people, I'm sorry, I want them to have the, the British and French and the Germans. They all learn each other's languages. Everybody knows a bit of German. Everybody knows a bit of French. Everybody knows a bit of English. Not too many people know a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of Latin. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I'm not going to learn Latin. I'm not going to learn Estonian. I love those countries. They're beautiful. Love them. Life is short. We're not going to learn less than less uh, words that have twenty-five dollars each of the books. So we're just not going to do it. That's why I finish it's not on my this evening. So the question is, will these places ultimately give up sovereignty? When will that happen? The theory of nationalism that I've given you says it will not happen. It will happen. Because nationalism came out of industrialism. We're now in a post-industrial age. And that tells us that nationalism should eventually pass too. When? The conditions? Schweizer. You have to go. I don't know. Who the hell? It'll happen at some point. Is it a model for other regions? That's what you're all asking yourself now, because you're not sick of hearing my voice yet. Asia? Perhaps. But it's not the same conditions. The issue is not preventing war from Japan, but dealing with the rise of China. And I know that Wong, Joe Wong, has talked about that a lot in this course. Can you bind China to the fate of the other countries in Asia the way Germany has bound itself? Bound itself to Europe. The Germans are in effect saying, we can't be trusted, you can't trust us, don't trust us, we can't be trusted, we're really bad, you've got to bind us, we've got to be part of you all. The Germans insist on all this stuff, they love Europe. I don't see the Chinese acting yet in that same way. Whenever anybody says to China, we'd like to uh, tell you about your human rights record, the Chinese usually say, uh, uh, screw you, you're trying to make us weak. <laughs> That's usually the response, right? You're infringing on our sovereignty, you can shut up now really. Chinese aren't quite where the Germans are. But if what you believe, what I've been saying in this course, that what produces that are not matters of will and kumbaya, but the fundamental economic forces at work that bring countries together, if you believe that, then you say the forces are the same. The Japanese and the Chinese will eventually go down this road. We're just not there yet. The fundamental forces that I'm talking about work everywhere. It just happens, so happens they're most advanced in Europe, and they're starting to be advanced in North America, and even in South America. Why not Asia? When the Africans, as they develop, they, as they eventually will, it will happen there too. The processes of regional integration are the same as the processes of national integration. Exactly the same. We created nation states out of small local units that eventually got to know each other and traded with each other and shared a common culture and then eventually desired to have institutions which covered all of that. And why won't that occur at a supranational level? After all, it's the same process. And one day, we might be here in Canada saying, you know, saying, you know, at one time, we had this flag, it was quaint, the flag, our little national anthem, we insert a little French into once in a while, and we had this thing, we were rah, 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 Canada. We might look back for about 200 years from now and say, to look at that as saying, that, you know, that was just as primitive as saying, you know, I love that Mel Brooks had that wonderful line where he talks about what were the origins of national, was there origins? There's that interview that he does with him, the, the 2,000 year old man, 
So the 2,000 year old man, they say, and he's interviewed by Rob Ryan. They're both very funny. He said, was there nationalism? You know, that's actually the 10,000 year old man. Was there nationalism 10,000 years ago? He said, yeah. He said, did you have a national anthem? He said, yeah. He said, what was the national anthem like? He said, here, I'll sing it to you. Everyone can go to hell except K7. <laughs> Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be CDC that's just as ridiculously particulars, right? The way it was like an Ontario song, right? And there's like a, probably a Saskatchewan song. I bet there's a Saskatchewan song. Is there a Saskatchewan song? Yes, how's it go? Is there a pirate song? <laughs> okay. Well, look at that, it's kind of great. How absurd! Right? How ridiculous! Okay. And how different is this in Canada? Here's what I want to say about it. Canada is in a constant state of nation building. We're constantly moving. We're constantly reinforcing Canada. It's all kinds of